Hello, welcome back to another Sabbath lesson with Rafa. Have you ever endured some hardships or illness or anything that was unpleasant and you just wondered why you were going through? Where did it come from? It seemingly came out of nowhere. Life was going fine. Have you often wondered, is the Most High punishing me for something? Maybe he is. Maybe he is judging you or correcting you, or maybe he's just testing you because he knows that you are faithful. Let's get into the word and find out which is which. When is he testing? When is he correcting? Get your paper and pencil ready. Make sure you have your sword, which is the word, and let's go. So in getting ready to begin our discourse on the topic, <clears throat> I have over the years heard many people, especially when there's something tragic happens to someone uh, and un what seems to be an untimely death takes place or someone dies in a very vicious way. I see, I often hear people say things like, well, if it's such a loving God, then why would he allow that to happen? These are people who really have no relationship with the Most High. They have no understanding of the Most High. And uh, most likely they didn't spend much time in uh, reading scriptures at all. <clears throat> in order to know the Most High, you have to make yourself available to him and you have to put your desires to the side and be willing to listen to what he is actually saying to you. So <clears throat> some people feel that if they are reading the Bible on a regular, consistent basis, long passages at a time, uh, that means they have a relationship with God. Some people believe that if, if they pray several times a day or on a consistent basis, they have a relationship with God. And both of those things are required of believers, but neither one of those things means that you have a relationship with God, especially if it is driven by your own objectives. You may be reading scriptures just so that you can sound like you are good with uh coming reciting verses you may be reading scriptures just so that you could get motivational bites scripture bites from what you read you might be reading scriptures just be, uh to say that you've read the entire bible so you might just be reading it for the content of what is in the volumes and not necessarily for what the most high is saying to you through what is written in the volumes. Um, many different reasons, a lot of them selfishly um, initiated. Sometimes we, a person might have a, a lifestyle and habit of what they think is praying, but in fact, they are just constantly making petitions to the Most High of what they want, their needs, and they never take time out to quiet themselves and listen to what he's saying. They talk so much, he doesn't have time to uh, have space to, to respond um, in a way. And so when, when you say, well, how do I know when God is talking to me? It's only through interaction with him, a give and take relationship where you are willing to listen and put Put your own selfish desires on hold to see what it is that he's really saying. For example, if I was adopted and my birth mother knew the, the, the people who adopted me and she stayed in the shadows all along, 
And then one day when I was older, I was I was about to do something that was <clears throat> that would probably bring uh, that would, you know, maybe bring judgment on myself through the legal system or whatever. And this this person comes out of the shadow and says, you really shouldn't do that. That that's not going to end up in a good situation for you. I'm not familiar with her voice and I might just brush her off, you know, even though she's my birth mother, because I haven't spent any time with her. I don't know her voice and I don't know how she relates to me. However, if my adopted mother it is comes right behind her and say, girl, don't do that. You're going to end up uh, in a bad situation, I might stop immediately. Why? Because I spent time engaging with her and I know her voice. If we don't spend time engaging with the Most High, we will not know his voice. And that's why you'll have people say, well, how do you know when God is talking to you? If that's a baffling question to you, that's a giveaway that you are not spending quality time with him. You're spending time with him your way, not his way. Um, also, uh, when you have a relationship with him, he knows the how to how to talk to you. He personalizes it. It might be that when you open scriptures and you're concerned or meditating about a situation you're going through, it might be that his way of speaking to you is through scriptures where you might read, be reading your uh, Bible and all of a sudden it might seem like a passage leaps off the page at you, becomes highlighted or emboldened or just really strikes your spirit. And that's the way the Most High deals with you. It might be that you have a lower faith and that you need something more tangible, visible, visible or audible, he might send someone into your life to speak to you. That might be the way he deals with you. He might deal with you specifically in dreams, or he might just put strong impressions of his will in your spirit, in your mind, but he knows the way that you will understand when you are hearing from him. But none of that happens without you have a relationship. So now, after I have digressed, <laughs> let me get back on course. Um, when a parent tells a child not to do something and that child does it, most responsible parents who are not overly permissive will correct the child in some kind of way. They are correcting the child out of love and uh, because the child did not listen to what it was that they were told not to do or to do. So when things happen to people, it is because we have a supreme God that we serve or even if we don't serve him, he's supreme. He made you, whether you choose to follow him or not, he's the creator. And so if he says, if you do these things, judgment will come on you, then you can't say if he's so loving, why did he allow this to happen? He is punishing disobedience. And it might not be disobedience of the person it might be disobedience of someone connected to the person. And that action uh, that he allows is to wake them up, to bring them to repentance, okay? And there are lots of other reasons. We can get into that at a much later date when we're dealing with generational curses and spiritual warfare and things like that. There are uh, lots of scenarios, but... Now, when we talk about is he testing me or judging me? Judging, another word for judging could be correcting or could be punishing. Okay, so whenever you come across judgments in scripture, that is a way of saying that the most high is some kind of, in some way, punishing someone or a nation. Okay, let's uh, look at... 
Um, this first verse that I would like, scripture that I would like to share with you is coming from Job chapter seven, verses 17 through 18. What is man that you magnify him and that you are concerned about him, that you examine him every morning and try him every, uh, that you examine him every morning and try him every moment. Okay. Who are we? that the most high would spend this time uh, examining us and testing us. Well, we are his creation and he has given us his ordinances. He's given us uh, his laws, statutes and commandments. And there's an adversary out there that's vying for us to be won over to his kingdom. There's an adversary out there that is wanting us to be disobedient so that we could take part in the punishment that he's going to receive. So the most high will allow us to be tested, to strengthen us because testing brings us back to him or solidifies our position in him. Okay. So um, if we look at James, if we look at James chapter one, Verses two through three, it says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. OK, so some people might say, if I'm being tried, there's nothing that I should be joyful about. I shouldn't be happy because I'm enduring a trial, um, but, you know. When there's a difference between happiness and joy, okay? But uh, not getting into that, I would say that whenever you are being tested of the Most High, it's a, it's actually a compliment because that is His way of telling the enemy, "Go on and try Him." I know for a fact that He is going to stay faithful to me because He never gives us more than we can bear. So if he has allowed the enemy to come at us in any kind of way, that is because he's confident of how we will respond in the end, just like he was with Job. Okay. Um, now, let's take a look at uh, Exodus 20 and 20. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you and in order that fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. Sometimes the most high tests us so that well, while we are experiencing the hardship of the test, we start examining our relationship with him. Because most likely, if you are someone who is righteous, who has a heart after the most high, when you start, in, when you find yourself in the midst of a trial, <laughs> when you find yourself in the midst of a trial, you will ask yourself, okay, what did I do to get here? And you'll start repenting of things. You'll start becoming more faithful in your reading of scriptures, your prayer life will amp up, all of those things. And so th those things will help keep you out of sin. And we know that sin is the transgression of law. So um, that's what Moses is telling the people. Don't be afraid when you find yourself in these trials and tribulations, you are just being tested. And if you rest assured that you are in a good relationship with the most high, then you can really, you could just settle into the test and know that he's going to carry you through it. He will show himself faithful all along the way to keep you from being discouraged. You might feel overwhelmed, but along the way, he will he will do little things to let you know, hey, I'm still with you. Don't falter, don't faint. I still, I'm still here. Okay. Let's take a look at um Deuteronomy 
chapter 13, verses three through four. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. Sometimes when we enter into a test, we will look for advice from outsiders. If you are someone who is surrounded by spiritual people, you might go to someone that you know has a gift of prophecy, or someone might come up to you and tell you that they dreamed something, or someone you might ask someone to try to interpret your dreams. But what we are he seeing here is do not rely on other people to try to define what is going on with you when the most high is testing you. That's what happened with Job. His friends tried to figure it out and they were wrong in almost every instance because it was simply just a test. It was nothing that Job did to bring it on himself. The most high was just proving to the enemy that Job was faithful. And then also it was to strengthen Job's faith in the Most High. So don't turn to someone else and try to have them interpret what is going on. If the Most High feels like you need that, he will send someone to you. You don't have to go and seek it, seek it out. So what he's requiring of you during times of testing is for you to just stay focused on him and in communication with him. Now, when we talk about, uh, while we're talking about Job, or you know, while I've just mentioned him, let me say this. Nothing can happen to us unless we have opened some doors. It doesn't matter how righteous you are. Nothing happens to us that's unpleasant. You are not tested. You are not judged unless there are open doors. Now, some people get caught up in self-righteous and they feel like I have lived a blameless life. Life. I keep the laws and statutes and commandments. I keep the holy days. Everything that I'm supposed to do, I do. Th that is a false sense of security because we all fall short. And there's guaranteed to be things that we are doing that we do not even realize because we've been in this world so long. We are doing things on a regular basis that offend the most high that we're not even aware of, you know? And so to have a position of being self-righteous is, is when you will find yourself in the middle of a test and walking away from the most high because <clears throat> you feel like he has betrayed you. Also, we are sometimes things that uh, we have done in the past that we have long since forgotten, we uh, don't repent of those things and they down the road have created an open door for the enemy to attack us in that area. Sometimes we have ancestors that have created, that have made covenants and agreements with the uh, enemy for their, um, for future generations or for different, uh, they've offered up different people in their family. And that is affecting you because those doors are, and gates and altars are still there. So we can't ever say that when we are tested, I was so righteous, I was not tested. The point I was going to make about Job is that if you read the Testament of Job, you will see that for everything we read about in the Canon Bible that Job experienced, <clears throat> there was a direct correlation to something he did that allowed the enemy to attack him that way. And he, at the time that he was doing different things, he may not have even thought they were significant or he may not have even realized the brevity of what he was doing, but the enemy used that as a way to attack him. He used it as a way to burn everything down. He used it as a way to 
uh, kill his children. I'm not going to go into those examples because I would really su strongly suggest that you pull up the Testament of Job. They have free PDFs of it on the internet and read that for yourself. It's a short read, but it's very intriguing and it will give you a clear understanding of what you read in the canonized uh, book of Job. Also, now I will say this, if you read in Jasher about Job, Job was one of Pharaoh's advisors, one of his counselors. And when the Pharaoh that was in reign at the time had forgotten how the children of Israel helped Egypt, he noticed that they were multiplying in numbers and he called his counselors in and asked them, what can we do to decrease their numbers because they're so pop they their population has grown so much. I am afraid that if another nation turns against us and they side with the other nation, we'll be overcome. Or that they might realize they have there are more of them than us and they will try to rule over us. Job was the chief counselor and he told them, this is in Jasher, he told the Pharaoh, kill all of the male, for all of the male children. Okay, now we fast forward to the Holy Bible. Bible and we read the account of Job, well, he was righteous and perfect, but that means he had a good heart. His heart was for the most high. What did he do in his past that left the door open? He ordered all of God's chosen people, the men, the male children to be killed. Okay, now we can kind of see why all of his kids were killed because that door was open. So whenever you are tested, you are tested in an area where some doors are open, whether you understand that or not. Okay, let me go on. I don't want to uh, digress too much because I actually just really love this topic. Um, uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. Because of the surpassing greatness of revelations, for this reason, this is Paul speaking, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for powers perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Okay, here we have Paul has been gifted with a lot of, he has, the Most High has trusted him with a lot of revelations. And to keep him from being puffed up and prideful, he was allowed to be tested in an area of his life that the Most High did not removed from him. It, it remained with him all the time to keep him humble. Okay. Uh, and that was a show to other people that despite what I'm dealing with, the most high is still empowering me for his kingdom. Now, what I want to say also about this, that kind of, uh, that kind of sheds a little light on testing is this when you know that you are being in that you are in a test if you have repented you have prayed you have prayed you have fasted you have enlisted the prayers of others and that burden is still there that is a sign that you are in a test because it's not so much anything that you did that you are being held accountable for. What you did just made an open door for you to be tested, but it's not what the most high, he's not punishing you. You cannot pray enough to come out of a test because the test the most high has you in has his end stamp on it. 
The only thing you can do is just trust him to carry you through it. He knows when he's going to bring that test to an end. You cannot pray it away, but you must remain prayerful during it. You must remain connected to him during it. Um, some examples of people who were in tests that had end stamps. If we look at Joseph, when he was in the dungeon after Pharaoh's wife accused him of trying to rape her and he was put in the dungeon, he could not pray in order enough to get out of that situation. And the Most High let him know along the way he was with him by giving him favor with the guards and favor with the other inmates. But no matter how much he prayed, that he remained in that situation because only the Most High knew when the end of that was going to be. If we look at Daniel, when he was put in the fiery furnace, he could not pray that away. And no, he said, you know, the most high could end this if he wants to. But even if he doesn't end this, I will still, my faith and allegiance will still be to him. He could not pray it away, but the most high sent uh, an angel in there with him to protect him through it. And uh, when the time period ended the next day, he came out of the fire untouched. Okay, when Abraham and Sarah wanted a child, they prayed and prayed and prayed. They were being tested in that area. And instead of giving up, they kept praying. They kept praying. The Most High knew when the end of that testing was going to be. And he sent some angels to tell them, this time next year, you'll be pregnant with a child. Now, they had been in that test so long till Sarah thought it was incredulous. You mean I've been dealing with this barrenness for all these years and now you're telling me I'm going to come to the end of it when I'm an old lady? It doesn't matter our age because the Most High can redeem the years for us. He can add years to our life, right? But uh, one thing that happens at the end of a test if you look through scripture, every single person that the Most High has ever tested was always um, redeemed and restored in front of everyone. Everyone, after they had passed judgment on the person, after they had cast doubt on the person's faithfulness and their walk, every single one, the person had to endure humiliation, but at the end of it all, they are always restored publicly. Every single occasion in scripture that you come across where someone was tested, that is the case. At the end of the test, there is open retribution. Okay, so keep that in mind. When you have prayed, 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 and you have repented, and you have fasted and you are still in the situation, it's not going anywhere, just look for the most high to give you signs that he's still with you because he will. And then rest assured that when it's all over, you will come out like pure gold. Now let's like look at a couple of scriptures that say as much. If we look at Job, Job chapter 23 and 10, but he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. If we look at James 1 and 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. Okay, so... Um, that is something to stay encouraged about. Let's take a look at the next scripture, which is that I have, which is Exodus chapter 16, verse four. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether or not they walk in my instructions. Sometimes when you seeming, it seems like life is going good for you, you're getting promoted all the, on, on your jobs, um, and you, you just seem to be coasting. That is when you probably should be on guard because a test is probably around the corner. And that test is for God to say, will you still love me when you are going through hard times? Will you still trust me when you are going through hard times? Okay, so um, that's what he did with the children of Israel. He gave them some things that they that they wanted and then he took it away from them just to see if they would remain. Deuteronomy chapter eight, verses two and three. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years. He might humble you, I mean, 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or, or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not even know what it was, nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that a man does not live by bread alone, but he lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So he took them through different trials when they were in the wilderness, testing their faith so that they could understand that it's not just in the good times that I'm your most high. I'm your good, your, your most high, even when you are experiencing discomforts, dis-ease in life. Here's a passage in Job, because we really can't talk about testing without talking about Job, can we? I mean... <laughs> It's like his story was just built specifically for that. So, so this is a long passage and I have it in two parts here. Job, uh, if you're writing down the reference, I kind of uh, skipped around in this chapter to highlight the main points instead of just reading the entire thing. Um, so you could write Job chapter 19 down the particular verses that I looked at is five and six, eight and 10, 13 through 15, and 25 through 29. So I'm going to read it for your hearing. You think you are better than I am and regard my troubles as proof of my guilt. Can't you see it is God who has done this? He has set a trap to catch me. God has blocked the way and I can't get through. He has hidden my path in darkness. See, when you're in a test, you can't pray your way out of it. He has taken away all my wealth and destroyed my reputation. A test will always involve what other people can see the most high doing to you. And it will humble you, bring humility upon you. He batters me from every side. He uproots my hope and leaves me to wither and die because the most high has drawn a line in the sand. He's told the enemy, you can do what you want to do. Just don't take his life. You can do this, but don't do that. You can go this far with him, but you can't cross this line. Okay. God has made my own family forsake me. I am a stranger to those who knew me. My relatives and friends are gone. God will strip everyone away from you. People will claim, uh, describe it often as their period of wilderness. Uh, he will put you in a position where it is you and him alone. Okay, so let's finish uh, the rest of that passage. Those who were guests in my house have forgotten me. My servant women treat me like a stranger and a foreigner. 
But I know there is someone in heaven who will come at last to my defense. Even after my skin is eaten by disease, while still in this body, I will see God. You have to remain faithful. I will see him with my own eyes and he will not be a stranger. My courage failed because you said, how can we torment him? You looked for some excuse to attack me, but now be afraid of the sword, the sword that brings God wrath on sin so that you will know there is one who judges. Uh, really, this is the interesting thing that happens when you are going through a judgment, I mean, a testing. People have to be careful onlookers have to be careful that they do not try to judge you because that will bring judgment upon them. So the thing they're accusing you of and casting judgment uh, on you about as they examine you will heap coals on themselves. Okay. This, that's what he's saying at the end of that passage. Um, when we see someone in the midst of a trial, it is best for us to keep silent and don't have discussions or discourse with others about what we suspect is going on because we never know if that person is being tested by the Most High or corrected by the Most High. It's very important that we don't cast judgment on what we see with our naked eyes. And we see that's what Job's friends were doing when they came to him. Well, maybe this is happening to you because you did this and that. Or maybe you're just not that faithful. You know, they were coming up with all kinds of reasons, which was essentially passing judgment. All right. Now, moving right along. He might put us in an impossible situation uh, just to see um, if you have faith in him. Let's take a look in the New Testament now. John chapter six, verses five through six. Everyone knows this story. Therefore, Jesus lifting his eyes up and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. When the Most High is testing you, now I'm not saying Christ is the Most High, but I'm digressing here. When the Most High is testing you, he already knows what he intends to do, how far this test is going to take place. Okay? He knows what's going to happen during the test. All right? Now, this is... The thing, sometimes he will send you through the same test again just to see if you have actually learned a lesson. And uh, here's an example of that. If we look at Mark chapter 8, verses 17 through 21, and Jesus, aware of this, said, This is the same situation, but a different time, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves and the five for the five thousands? How many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? And they said to him, 12. When I broke the seven for the four thousand, how many large baskets of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying unto them, do you not yet understand? Sometimes you will have the same situation crop up in your life again because the Most High is testing to see if you really learned the lesson. Are you going to sail through it this time because you learned the lesson the last time? Or are you still going to have the same emotions creep up the same doubts come, come up and whatnot. Uh, sometimes he puts us through the same lessons, uh, the same test, because we didn't learn the lesson. He had a timestamp for the lesson to end, and it ended when he 
predetermined it would end. But it, he said, you know, she didn't really get it. She she didn't really get it. I'm going to give her a little reprieve, a little break from this situation. Then we're going to visit this again to see, you know, it's kind of like in school when you have a quiz and then you have a test over the exact same information, the same material. Okay. Moving along, Hebrews chapter three, verses eight and nine. Do not harden your heart as when they provoked me, talking about the children of Israel, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Okay, sometimes people think, uh, surmise that they were in the wilderness because they were rebellious. The wilderness was a test of the faith and the Most High already knew it was going to last 40 years when he took them out of Egypt. We see several times when they were in the wilderness that they were in prayer. There was one time when Moses called for the 70 elders and they were all in intense prayer on one accord. That didn't take them out of the wilderness. It didn't end the test. Why? Because it was a test. Prayer does not end a test. Okay. But um, the, the what I'm bringing out in this scripture, Hebrews 3, 8 through 9, is this. While you are in a test, don't turn around and try to test the most high. Don't say within yourself something like, well, if you're really still here for me, then let this happen. You know, Gideon laid out a fleece. He said, well, if you really want me to do this thing, I'm going to put this wool out. And when I wake up in the morning, the wool is going to be wet, but the ground under it's going to be dry. So God humored him and did that. And then he said, okay, let me let me try you one more time. I, I know you did this, but you know, I, I'm still not sure. If you're really with me, when I wake up in the morning, let the ground be wet, but the wool be dry. And, and the most high humored him. But do not get it twisted. We should not get in a practice of laying out a fleece for the most high. He's there and either you know he is or you have wavering faith. As a matter of fact, Christ told us. Well, before I even get to what Christ said, let's look at, do I have that one there? Um, what was, I just read Hebrews. Okay, now I'm gonna go on to what Christ said. Christ said in Matthews four through seven, Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay? Do not test him. Just have faith in him. Don't test him. And uh, what I would like to say uh, at the end of this segment on testing is I'd like to direct us to Psalm 17 and 3. You have tried my heart. You have visited me at night. You have tested me and you find nothing. I have purpose that my mouth will not transgress. Okay. Just like Job, though he tries you, don't curse him. Do not turn your back on him. I said that was going to be the end of what I had to say about testing, but actually I wanted to bring something else out. Um, some ways that we might be tested, people have said that, you know, the enemy comes to you in several ways. He'll attack your finances. He'll attack your health. He'll attack your relationships. And these are ways that he will publicly humiliate you. He's only doing what the most high gives him space to do. Okay. We know that sickness is actually the most high testing you. Can you pull up Job 33 and 19 in the good news translation? 
and read it for us? Job 33, 19, God corrects us by sending sickness and filling our body with pain. Okay. That's one of the way that he corrects us. And how do we, um, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. Correction. That's, we're, that's, that's getting into judgment. Okay. Um, so when he judges us, He's punishing us because we are being disobedient. Um, now, the judgment, as long as we are on this side of the veil, is not a death sentence. Okay. Final judgment is when, uh oh, excuse me. Final judgment is when. He judges your soul with an eternal judgment. Okay. We'll look at a scripture for that in a second, but some ways that he judges us might be like I said before, in those ways that people credit Satan with coming at us, he might test your health. He might test your finances. He might test your sickness. In the scripture you just read in Job, it says that, read it again for me. God corrects us by sending sickness and filling our bodies with pain. Okay, that is one way. Now, um, also, if you don't mind, pull up James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You said James 5, um, 15 through 16? 14 through 16. Fourteen, 14 through 16. Good news? Or it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Um, if, if any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven of him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Okay. At a later time, I'm going to get into uh, the mysteries of healing. But one thing about judgment is this. When you are being judged, you can repent and that will bring it to an end immediately or very quickly. When you're being tested, no amount, no amount of praying is going to bring it to an end. But if you are being judged for disobedience and you repent, you will be taken out of that and restored right back to where you were. Now, at the end of testing, because of all that you endured, you are rewarded with open retribution. But when you have been in disobedience and you repent, then the Most High just stops what you're going through and you're right back to where you were. Now, a lot of people, 
because this world has convinced us to believe in science so false, so so called falsely, that's what the scripture says, so called falsely, or we have been groomed to rely on doctors. And so we start buying into the whole thing about germs and uh, all these different reasons about being sick. It's just something that happens naturally. Sickness is not a natural occurrence. It's a spiritual thing. And that's why we see in James, it even tells you that your sins will be forgiven when the prayers of the elders are offered to you. And then it tells you to seal it by confessing your faults. We can see in the New Testament where the young man was lame and all of the people that came across the, uh, uh, Christ asked him, why is he sick? Is it something he did or something his parents did? Back then they had an understanding of how sickness went. Now we have been, our minds have been washed so that we separate our disobedience from what's happening to us physically. I can tell you this personally. Anytime I feel myself beginning to feel ill and I start repenting or asking the Most High to whatever the enemy is accusing me of before your throne, I repent of it. Let the blood of Christ cover me and whatever I'm being accused of. Bring, let your Holy Spirit bring to my remembrance what I need to turn my thoughts away from, my actions away from. As soon as I repent, I am within a day feeling 100% better. I'll give you another, another story. When my, one of my sons got married, not far into his marriage, his wife started feeling ill. And I kept having the strong impression, tell her she needs to repent. And I said, well, she doesn't really know me that well. And that would be kind of offensive for me to just contact her and say, you know, I heard you're not feeling good. You might want to repent. But it was just weighing on me so heavy. So finally I called. I text her and said, hey, I hope you're not offended by what I'm about to say, but a lot of times when we're sick, it's because there's something we need to repent for. So I would encourage you to maybe consider repenting. She, this is how you know when you are moving according to the Holy Spirit. There was no offense on her end, she immediately said, I know, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm going to spend some time in prayer and repenting. She did that. And within a day, she was feeling practically 100% better. Okay. So when we are being judged, repentance will bring that judgment to an end. Now, a lot of times, we don't, the prescription is written for us in, in right in the Bible, but we don't act on it because people get so offended so easily. They could be on their deathbed and you could go in the room and say, you need to spend some time repenting and they will, I don't have nothing to repent for. I'm, I live a holy life. You know, they, they get offended instead of taking it as a, as advice. And as a result, nobody, well, not nobody, that's an exaggeration, but as a result, few people uh, are willing to tell a person to repent so that their situation can be reversed. Okay. But like I said, I'll do a teaching on the mysteries of healing at a later date. Let's move right along. Um, sometimes when we are being judged, the Most High will give us a grace while we are still on this side of the veil. He'll give us a grace um, to repent. But then sometimes the, the judgment is instantaneous and that, that time span is not there. And you we don't want to fall on that side of um, that side of things.
Let's take a look at Romans chapter 2, verses th verse 3. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? When we um, are judging others, like I said previously, we are judged the same way that we judge them. James 2 and 13 says, for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. When you see someone going through a hard time, sympathize and empathize with them. Don't have an attitude of this is exactly what they get. They should have gotten this. Put yourself in their shoes or in the shoes of their loved ones and have compassion. Matthew 7 and 2, for in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Okay, that's pretty clear. Don't open yourself to testing that wasn't meant for you. Okay. Um, you know, our trials and tribulations are kind of custom tailored to what we can handle. You know, scripture says he won't give you more than you can bear. So I might be able to endure intense illness. That might be the area the most high uses to judge or test me. You might have a, a tolerance for uh, operating with lack, where if all of your wealth was taken away from you, it wouldn't actually break you. Now, if I am ill and you are passing judgment saying, you know, she's probably ill because of this and that and blah, 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 and you're judging me. Now you open yourself up to be judged in that same way in an area that you might not be strong enough to handle. Okay. So that's another reason why you sh we should not be passing judgment on anyone else. Okay, let's look at um, Ecclesiastes 12 and 14. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Correct Jeremiah 10 and 24. Correct me, O Lord, but with justice but not with your anger, or you will bring me to nothing. Second Thessalonians 1 and 5. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you, for which indeed you are suffering. Okay, I trust that you have written those scriptures down. Now let's talk about them. Uh, a little bit. Before you talk about them, could you please tell me right before Ecclesiastes, you had a Matthew. I didn't get a chance to see the um, which uh, book and I'm uh, not book, which um, chapter verse. verse, chapter seven, verse two. Okay. Ecclesiastes 12 and 14 said, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. We can't be self-righteous and say that um, we are above judgment, we are above testing, because he knows every intention of our hearts. And a lot of times people do things behind closed doors where man can't see, but the most high sees. And so the way we live behind closed doors, what's done in darkness will always come to the light. People can have a sense. Now, we are not to put our mouth on people when God is dealing with them, but you can, what he's doing is for you to observe. And we can observe how you are walking with the most high based on the things that are, that's happening to you. Okay, so um, with things that you do that you think you're hiding from other people and in the public, you're coming across as righteous. We can tell 
if your marriage is faltering and then on top of that, you lost your job and on top of this and that, all these things, calamities keep coming upon you. That is a sign most of the time that you are being judged. Or if nothing else, even if you're being tested, that's a sign that those are areas where you have a lot done something disobedient to allow the testing uh, to be carried out in that way. Okay, so whatever the Most High is putting you through is a sign to others of where you are spiritually. Jeremiah says, correct me, O Lord, but with justice, not with your anger. Because when you judge people and he turns around and judges you, he's angry when he's judging you. All that talk you did about someone else's situation, he coals on your head, okay? He's judging me out of love. He's correcting me. He's judging you out of anger, okay? He's disappointed in you because you put your mouth on something that did not pertain to you, all right? Second Thessalonians 1 and 5 said, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. If he's judging you on this side of the veil, on this plane, that is because there is still hope for redeeming you. There's hope for you to correct your behavior and come back under obedience. There's still hope for you to make it into the kingdom. So his judgments are righteous. He knows you that maybe in your heart, you didn't realize that you had gone astray, that you were drifting. And he's doing this to yank you back, to wake you up. Okay, look, you're about to go too far now. I have to do something about, okay, I warned you, I warned you. Now I got to do something about it. Okay, and this is for your own good so you don't bring yourself to destruction. Um, age doesn't matter. It doesn't matter uh, when how old you are when he judges you, okay? <laughs> um, Ecclesiastes 11 and, 19, 11 and 9 says, rejoice young man during your childhood and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood. And go on, follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. You can't say, oh, I'm just young and innocent. You know, uh, sometimes teenagers will throw that up at an adult when an adult is trying to chastise them about something. They'll say, well, you know, I'm just young. I'm just a young person. You know, I'm not an adult yet. Or you should know better. I'm just a kid. This Ecclesiastes 11 and 9 says, no, you will be judged for all these foolish things that you do. Go on, enjoy yourself, have a good time, but don't try to throw it up and say I'm young, so I'm untouchable. The Most High is just going to wink at me. Psalms 27, 25 and 7 says, remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake. Remember not the sins of my youth. Age does not keep you from being judged. Okay. Um, moving right along. That was, when we look at, and I'm, I'm almost through. First Timothy, 5 and 24, the sins of some men are quite evident going before them to judgment for others and going before them to judgment for others, their sins follow after. Sometimes, like I said, the most high will give you the mercy of judging you right now so that you can get your act together. But for some people, he lets you live out the full measure of your sin. He lets you just keep ramping up and up and up because your heart is far from him. And while you may die and people might look at you in your casket and said, wow, this person lived a life totally separated from God, yet they died with all their riches and glory. 
That's because their judgment is coming at after they pass on. Okay. Um, and I'll look at that. I'll pull that scripture up, I think, coming up next. Matthew 10 and 28 says, not next, but after this slide. And fear not them which can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. When you are being judged, don't worry about what people are doing to you, what the Most High is allowing to be done to you. Your concern is to stay, get back in his graces because he can destroy your life. He can take your life. And then on top of that, he can destroy your soul. And our souls were meant to be everlasting but he can destroy your soul in the lake of fire. Let's look at, um, uh, I wanted to look at a scripture Um, Hebrews 9 and 27, I don't think I have it here. I don't think I have it in my slides, but Hebrews 9 and 27 says, in as much as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes the judgment, okay? So if he's judging you while you're still alive, consider that to be his grace and mercy because after you die, that is your final judgment and there's nothing you can do about that. At that point, it's too late to repent. Sometimes people operate as though... Um, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but, you know, I'll just tell the most high that I saw everybody else doing it and I didn't want to be the odd man. We come up with all these little pretend conversations about how we're going to excuse it away to the most high. Once we die and that judgment comes, the book is sealed. It's closed. There's no more reckoning. There's no more repenting. There's no more explaining. At that point, it's a done deal. You will not have a chance to stand before the throne and explain your actions because the book will be closed at that point. Everything about you would have been written. Okay. Um, I want to go on to the next set of scriptures. <clears throat> I only have a, a couple more slides. Uh the, Luke 6 and 37, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Okay. Uh, Matthew 12 and 41, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. All right, we see that the when Jonah went and preached uh, to the people, when he rebuked the people of Nineveh and the king of Nineveh, they repented and their judgment was stopped by the Most High. What he had planned to do to them, he stayed his hand because they repented. All right. Some examples of people who repented during their judgment. We have Jonah. He was being judged with tormentuous, tormentuous. I don't think that's a word. <laughs> he was on the ship and there was a great tumult in the sea. The sea was raging. He was thrown over because of his disobedience. 
And as soon as he repented, the fish that had swallowed him spit him out. His repenting brings your judgment to an end. Nebuchadnezzar, when the Most High said, the minute you start saying that you are the great king and you have all these conquests because of what you did, I'm going to judge you. Well, he slipped up and he's like, all this happened because of me. And then he went mad. His fingernails grew long like the talons of a bird. And he was just looking like a wild man. He was out of his mind. But when he had the presence of mind to repent, he immediately came out of that judgment. Now, Zechariah, when the angel came to him and said, you're going to name your son John. It's such a basic name. I don't know why Zechariah was giving him pushback, but for some reason, Zechariah thought it was funny. Maybe if I remember correctly, maybe it was because of Elizabeth's age. I don't know. I could be wrong with that. But at any rate, Zechariah was dubious of the child and naming him John. So he was made mute in judgment. When the child came, he repented within himself, and he, as soon as he wrote down his name is going to be John, when they were all trying to decide what they were going to name, he wrote it down as a sign of repentance. Immediately, he was able to speak, okay? Um, but sometimes that grace to repent is not there because the wickedness in your heart. When Ananias and his wife lied, about how much they had to give the most high, they were killed suddenly. Most of the time when we see in scripture where someone is killed suddenly, someone dies suddenly, it's because of a judgment uh, and of something that was within their heart that greatly displeased the most high. We see all through scripture that when most people that were righteous die, the most high gives them time and space for closure. They are able to summon their children around them, give them final words. They are able to reflect on their life. They are able to repent for anything that need they need to repent repent of, even though they might be weak or old or feeble, they are given time and space and mercy. But when they die suddenly, it's usually because of something that was very great in their heart that displeased the Most High. We see that all through scripture. These are things that are unpleasant that in today's age, we soothe ourselves with pacifying stories as to why things happen the way they do. But when we read scripture, it is what it is. And we have to be mindful of the way the Most High deals with his creation so that we don't fall down those same paths. Okay? Um, I think that... Um, I want to look at this scripture right here, these two scriptures, Zechariah 13, eight through nine. It will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it, okay? The third that's left in it are those who have been tested and tried and are righteous. They remain faithful. Revelation 3 and 10 says, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. So this is a promise that we can hold on to. That if we can endure the testing and trials that the Most High allow us in our daily lives, when he has that hour of testing the world for destruction, he will protect us. He will hide us because of our faithfulness to him. Because we endure testing trials and judgment without losing faith in him, 
he will protect and cover us when he is judging those who have no faith in him and who do not proclaim or profess him to be their God. Okay, so that is a great thing that consider these little trials and tests that we experience today to be nothing compared to the tribulation and trials and judgment of the world that we will be spared from. Okay, um, I want to look at, uh, go back a little bit to testing before we go into the memory verse. Uh, I neglected to share this with us. Uh-oh. I neglected to share this with us. I wanted to take a look at the Lord's Prayer, just this one little part. If you look at Matthew 6, verse 13, it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. A lot of people struggle with the part that said, lead us not into temptation. What do you mean? The most high tempts us? That word temptation means lead us not into testing. Please most high, find me in a state of obedience to the point and a state of repentance to the point where you do not feel the need to have to test me. Because right here we see that temptation and the call number for temptation is, it's the Greek word 3986. Well, let's look at what the Greek word 3986 means. The Greek word 3986, parasmus, means <clears throat> a putting to proof by experiment of good experience of evil. So something bad is happening to you for a good outcome testing, uh, the solicitation of discipline or provocation. You are being called to be disciplined by being provoked to see how you're going to respond. By implication of adversity or temptation or to be tried. Now this comes from 3986, the Greek word Word 3986. Let's see what the Greek word 3986 means. The Greek word 39, not 3986, 3985 means to test. See that? Lead us not into temptation means lead us not into testing. To entice discipline, examine to go about to prove, to tempt, okay? So when it says, lead us not into temptation, that is not the most high tempting you. Oh, you know, I had this, I, I said, I gave into this sin because the most high was tempting me. No, that is not what that prayer, that verse, that line in that prayer is saying. He does not tempt you, all right. Now, so let's go on to our memory verse. I have it in the King James Version, and I have it in the Good News Translation. Psalms 119, verse 66 through 68. Teach me good judgment and knowledge. Knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. Okay, well, if you don't understand that 17th century English, <laughs> let's get pull it up in the Good News Translation. Basically, that memory verse is saying, give me wisdom and knowledge because I trust in your commandments in your commands. Before you punished me, I used to go wrong, but now I obey your word. How good you are, how kind. Teach me your commands.
Okay, I'm going to, uh, we're going to have a little discussion because I've, I've definitely gone longer than I intended to go. Um, the discussion question today is looking back over some of your hardships, can you identify when you were tested versus being corrected by the Most High? So that now that we have looked at how it operates, how it works, can you think of a time that you're willing to share of when um, you just thought it was a hardship, but now looking back, based on how you responded to it, you could tell that it was testing or how you responded to it, you could tell that it was judgment. Um. Let me think about it. Or I know I kind of just oh, okay, go ahead. Um wait, <laughs> say the question again. One more time, one more time. The question is, can you think of a time when now that now that we've taken examine the difference between testing and judgment? Can you think of a time that you were tested or judged um, that you didn't realize what was going on until now that you look at it? I've got a particular instance in mind. However, I'm trying to figure out where it lands. Let me think. So you, you don't have to share it because it's, it might be personal or, uh, you know, a sensitive area. But that situation that you were in, did you do a lot of praying and repenting or just praying? Or did you just really sometimes we don't when we're when something happens to us that's uncomfortable we don't even pray or repent for it. We just kind of roll with it. Like we just, we kind of think it's something that we brought on ourselves, or something that just happened out the clear blue. And we don't stop and say, you know what? I think I'm bringing this on or maybe I'm being tested in this area. We just kind of roll with the punches. You get laid off for, from a job and you think, well, you know, there's such evil people. Um, they just laid me off for no reason or whatever. And we don't stop and think that maybe the most high is testing you. Mm -hmm. uh, did you know? And so we don't pray about it or anything like that. We just accept it as it's happening. This is what I will say that whenever anything happens to us out of the clear blue, or whenever anything unpleasant happens to us, we should not just think that it's happenstance. We should not just think that it's just something that happened because the promises from the most high are yea and, and amen and to give us hope and a future. And he promises not to harm us. So if things that are, are happening to us are unpleasant, it's being allowed for a reason, and that should always cause us to reflect on our relationship with the Most High. Where are we in Christ? Are we have we become uh, lazy? Have we become ritualistic? We might not be lazy. We might say every day I read three chapters in the Bible and I pray three times a day, but has it just become a ritual where you are not really connecting with what you're doing? Because that's the same as being far off. So whenever things happen to us, we shouldn't just, you know, if we're sick, we just have, we shouldn't just say, oh, there's a cold going around. There's a flu going around. That's why I'm sick. Well, everybody isn't getting sick. Why is it that everyone is not getting sick? How did you become open to it? Okay. So um, if you read the Testament of Solomon, 
he interviews like a hundred different spirits and asks them, what is their uh, character? What is it that you do to man? And how can man avoid having you interact with them? And when you read the Testament of Solomon, you will find out that sickness is a spirit. And almost every disease that we can encounter has a, is, is directly attached to a spirit that is being manifested. Spirits only come after us when there is an open door. Okay? So these are books that are outside of the Bible that people have been told over the decades and centuries, or well, not centuries, because some of them were very popular in other centuries. People have been told over the decades to stay away from these readings. However, when you read them, it will greatly show you what you need to do to tighten up your walk. To, I mean, they hold the key when you read a lot of them. Now, some of them you will read and immediately, if you have any discernment, you'll say, oh, no, nah, this seems off. And there's nothing in here pointing me to Christ. There's nothing in here, you know, this just seems, it's, it's just not, it doesn't seem believable. You know, if something is believable or if it's not, if it's edifying or not, the Holy Spirit will connect with it. But anyways, like I'm saying, when things happen to us, don't ever just let them railroad through or happen without you pausing to reflect. And like I said, if you pray about it and pray about it, then just say, okay, I think I'm being tested in this and the most high is with me. Whatever, however crazy I look to other people when this is all over, I'll come forth as pure gold and they will see that it was the most high's doing. You can cry innocent, innocent, innocent all you want. People are going to judge you amongst themselves or within themselves. And it's not until you are openly vindicated that they will have to take their words back. Okay, you just have to deal with the humiliation. Can you stand the fire? <laughs> Is there anything you want to say about the um, about the lesson or anything that struck out? Um, I well, first of all, I definitely once again enjoyed the lesson immensely. Um, I think some of those things um, that were pointed out are things that we typically don't think of often, especially uh, being in the regular church or going to church services, they're not pointed out. Those parts in the story where we open ourselves up to various judgments and um, testing and stuff like that. Um, and even when it comes to uh, the idea of sickness, because, you know, a lot, just like you said, Everybody's not getting sick, even on those occasions where it's like a simple cold or whatever. A lot of times, even I think with me and Megan have talked about before, um, even when it comes to issues that we have during our uh, cycle and stuff like that, um, like the emotional highs and lows and things like that, that people think are really normal and really common. And then I'm like, hmm feels like there's a spiritual component to it because how can you you're just going through and then suddenly you're you're like irrational and doing all this stuff and I think there's an opening there where we become more sensitive to whatever spirit is trying to afflict us and I've noticed that whenever times have come that I've noticed that um years ago I started this I was like I noticed that um if I if I caught a hold of what was going on and then I prayed about it, said, no, I'm not going to do this, this with whatever the spirit is that's trying to afflict me during this time, um, then I didn't have any of those symptoms um, and the instability and whatever. So I think um, we just don't pay enough attention to how the spirits 
operate and how God as a spirit operates. Um, and we don't give him enough credit for being as awesome and as wise as he is. Uh, yeah. Exactly. You know, we have to have the presence of mind, like you're saying, um, because we are spiritual and we live in a spiritual world. There's a couple that I follow, Erica and Simon Kisa. Uh, um, I think that's their name. Anyways, they are always saying that we are spiritual beings in a spiritual world. Um, now, uh, is is Megan still listening? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, would you like to say anything that has come to you during this lesson or anything you want to share? Or do you have any questions? Um, I don't have any questions, but uh, Rakita and I, like, we were really grateful for, I'm going to turn it towards me, so it's not like a, a disembodied voice. So, like, so we've really just been enjoying all of these Bible studies. Like, they've been timely, and we, we're sitting here and um and our own strength and like we're like googling scriptures and like oh god will bring some things to us but just to have the knowledge of all of these different um scriptures and like you said books that are not in the bible um be brought and put together in a one like unified topic has been a blessing to us um in regards to what i've heard in the study today like it definitely made me go back and 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 look at my life, and like you said, of like things that I thought were just hardships, and now I'm just kind of like I hear like my mom or my grandma, whoever, oh you know, just put a put a bandit on, or oh just drink some tea, or oh blah blah blah, and like not really, yeah, just like worldly superficial things that never really got to the issue of what it was, and I mean sure it eventually went away, but. It's like, where's the faith in that? Like, what? That's just such a a, a simple and uninspired God, like un like just life of of like, oh, like things happen to me, and I and like the God that I serve like has no power over that. Like, I'm just kind of like, ah, <laughs> yeah, you know. And to to think about those things more spiritually of like, what is God asking for me? What does this mean? Have I done something, God? Like, what would you have me to do? And to immediately turn to Him versus just like, oh, I can fix it in my own strength. It's just like, how much more meaningful and powerful would our walk be if we just assumed and and knew that like everything that happens to us is from God or because God has allowed it. And if we were to just turn to him first, <laughs> not to our yeah. friends, not to our mom, not to social media, not to some whatever, not to the, say those things can't be helpful, but we, did we check with him first? Um, so that's exactly. what I got. There's a, a hymn that says, what, what needless pains we bear because yes. we don't take it to God in prayer. Yeah. You know, if we would just take it to him first, mm -hmm. everything would be fine. You know, I can remember when I was in the workforce as a teacher, I had an administrator who told the bookkeeper to dock my pay because during post some post planning days, there was a, a now the the habit of the staff on post planning day was that we came in and out of the building at leisure, you know, going out to eat or going to the store, or just, there was no set schedule. The door was kind of open. We didn't have to check in with anyone. Well, she had a potluck and you know, I don't eat from other people really. And um, so I went out, left the campus to go out to eat. And when I came back, she saw me and she said, oh, I called you at the uh, potluck because, you know, I was acknowledging all the teachers that weren't going to be returning. I had put in a resignation. And um, admittedly, I said something a little snippet to her. And she retaliated by having the bookkeeper notate that I had not signed in or out. And she wanted me to be docked for pay that day. So, you know, when I found that out, the bookkeeper said she had questioned, are you sure you want to do this? Because no one really had been signing in or out. She's like, are you sure you want to do this? And, and she said that the, that the principal told her, yeah. So I called the board and tried to plead my cause. And I did this and that. And, and you know, in my mind, I 
finally I was, I drove to the school and before I got out of the car, you know, I had this, this whole conversation already worked out in my mind, how I was going to tell her this and that and blah, 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 blah. And then I said, Father God, you know, I'm your child and I want to represent you. Please work the situation out where I do not make you look bad. I walked in, into that school. Now, I hadn't prayed about it at all prior to that. I was just reacting. I walked into that school. Soon as I got to the sign-in desk, she came out of her office. Um, incidentally, she came out of her office at the same time. And she said, oh, Miss Roper, I took care of that situation. Don't worry about it. She had withdrawn the paperwork docking my pay. I prayed and immediately, because I put God first, he turned the situation around without me having to say a word. I was almost disappointed that I didn't get to present my argument. Because you had it all, you know. Yeah, you know, like, you know, I had it all worked. I was yeah. almost like flabbergasted, like, uh, 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 okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But, um, yeah, we endured the, so many things because we don't just go to God and, 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 and ask him how this is going to be resolved first or what is the next step I need to take. You know, uh, when we talk about testing and, um, and judging and we say how when you are being judged, if you repent, the Most High will immediately bring it to an end. When David numbered his army, when the Most High did not want him to and told him not to, I don't know if he told him not to, but he definitely didn't want him to. David numbered the army and the Most High sent a prophet to him to say, look, <laughs> you just messed up because you already know we serve a big God and now you want to just double check behind him to make sure you have enough people. He's like, this and this and this is going to happen to you. David picked, I mean, David repented and, uh, the Most High still punished, but it wasn't what it could have been had he not repented. When Hezek, when the prophet told Hezekiah, you're going to die, and Hezekiah was sick, Hezekiah repented, put on sackcloth, turned his face to the wall, repented, and prayed and cried out to God. And what happened? The Most High added years to his life. He didn't really add years to his life. He gave him back the years that he was going to take. <laughs> okay. And so when we, when we are quick to repent and not act self-righteous, like we are above any kind of punishment or correction, then he is faithful and just, he will immediately restore us, you know? Um, and so, yeah, well, I absolutely love this topic because it's one that mystifies people when things are happening to them. And then I like I want to just reiterate one final time. Whenever you're going through something and you truly repent and pray and fast about it and it doesn't go away, just settle back and relax and say, okay, I'm being tested. And the Most High is going to carry me through this. No matter what happens, he's not going to let me die. And he's not going to uh, bring me to complete ruin. And at the end of this, I, I just know he's going to restore me. So I'm just going to have to go through it. You know, even though it's going to be uncomfortable and hard. <laughs> so rejoice because he trusted us enough to test us because he knew that we would stay faithful. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. If you have any questions about the content of this lesson, or you have any spiritual questions in general, if you would like to participate in the Zoom lessons and discussion, uh, DM me for any of the above. I have my Instagram handle in the description box, and I will be happy to respond to you.